welcome back. And uh, as we promised this morning, the conversation uh, is about the recent suspension of the seismic survey that should have taken place in the deep waters of Belize. Unfortunately, we did not have our government representatives this morning. They did not show up following confirmation on Friday. But we do have the representative of the representatives of the environmental community with us this morning. We have Nadia Bode of the World Wildlife Fund. We have Rinaldo Guerrero, who is the first vice president of the BTIA. And we have Amanda Burgos Acosta of the Belize Audubon Society. Good morning and welcome, Good morning. and thank you for joining us. Let's begin uh, by talking firstly about the seismic survey from a uh, scientific perspective. If you can shed some light on exactly what was to take place and what the perceived impacts are to the environment would have been. Okay, um, I guess about two weeks ago, we were, um, we were informed that um, the environmental community, or a subset of the, in the environmental community, I, com community, I should say, um, learned of the proposed um, seismic activity. No? Well, actually, it was the multi-beam before, and then a week later, we found that cabinet um, had given the green light for the seismic portion of the, um, the project. No? Um, our um, concern um, stems from the fact that there was no environmental um, assessment done for the proposed activity. Um, for something like this, there has to be an analysis of the cumulative, you know, the potential cumulative impact of uh, uh, an activity of this scale, um, given our very fragile environment. No other country have what we have. We have the second largest reef in the world. We have four of the Caribbean atolls. Um, to give permission for something like this, um, you need to really analyze the situation. And not only the environmental impact, but you have to look at the social impact as well, given that a number of stakeholders are um, dependent on the marine environment, dependent on our reef system. Um, from our research, um, and these are scientific robust research, um, have shown that um, seismic activity these really do have um, a potential impact on the marine environment, on the marine species. Um, the shock wave um, associated with those song waves um, can have ripple effect um, across miles, hundreds of miles. No? So we cannot just permit something without looking at what the pot potential impact is. And you cannot um, extrapolate something from another country to Belize because, as I mentioned before, what we are dealing with is different in terms of our environment. Can we take a step back? Because I think one of the things we need to make very clear to the public is what is a multi-beam survey and what is a seismic survey um, and how it's conducted. So let's start with the multi-beam survey. How would it be conducted? Um, well, exactly as you're saying, there's two different processes happening. There was a multi-beam, which basically used different technology and it did a map of the entire sea floor. Um, and then the seismic is specific to oil. The seismic, because of the hydrophones and the technology that it uses, it goes deeper into the substrate. Mm -hmm. um, I can't speak to the exact technology of what was being used. There was, it depends on the vessel. And I believe okay. for multi-beam, they did say the exact equipment, but for seismic, we only were told that it was air guns. Okay. So we don't know the exact technology. Um, the multi-beam, as we had been saying previously, the multi-beam, has a multitude of benefits and things that it can be used for. Um, to my understanding, um, the multi-beam should have occurred earlier. Mm -hmm. um, somewhere around the 12th of the month, it should have happened. Um, by all accounts, it probably occurred. We don't know um, concretely mm -hmm. until it is confirmed from geology unit. Um, but it is... Um, it is probably good, it's, well, we can assume that it <laughs> happened already because it had been approved. Yeah. The seismic was a different um, vessel and different technology. And the seismic has different impacts because of the, um, the technology, as we were saying, it can impact whales, it can impact um, dolphins, yeah. large mammals. Um, so I do want to clarify, though, we keep saying environmental, and it's I not was, solely yeah. environmental. Yes. Mr. Mr. Reynaldo is here representing yeah, the BTA. Um, BTA, which is an entirely additional stakeholder. Yeah. And I do want to make it clear that it came to the environmental community, but we quickly dispersed the information to the tourism sector mm -hmm. and to the fisheries. Um, because the fishermen out there are also concerned and impacted. And it seems to be a topic that... Um, 
that amalgamated a lot of people very quickly under this yeah. Let me ask a question here. Maybe, maybe if I can um, wrap this, bring my mind to this. Is it to say then that, because when I, when I looked and listened to what the chief environmental officer was saying earlier, that because it doesn't fall within, or the, the activity would not have been conducted within a designated area, such as either a World Heritage Site or what have you, that an EIA was not necessary. If I'm to understand that, did they not take into consideration the, the other impact that it would have, even though you're not really doing the activity within, let's say, a specific area that you guys would have either purview over or what have you? Is that correct? Yes. Um, the, the reality of it is, I think, when we saw the first map that mm -hmm. showed where the lines were, mm -hmm. they did um, clarify that they are not going within the atolls, they're not coming within the barrier reef, the lagunal system, and they were pretty much staying, I believe that it was one kilometer yeah. away from the um, protected areas or the atolls. Mm -hmm. What our concern was is that it's a huge breadth of area. Yeah. And so you, you should, by right, ask for an environmental impact assessment. Um, seismic testing had been moved a couple years ago from Schedule 1, which means it shall have an EA, to Schedule 2, which means it may require. May require then leaves it to the discretion mm -hmm. of the department. Um, they have in their purview to look at the impacts or the perceived impacts and then make a decision. Um, we feel that the decision in this case, because of the ecosystem, because of the breadth of the study, it does require an EIA. Now, Mr. Guerrero, as a stakeholder in the tourism industry, uh, as a representative of the Tourism Industry Association, what has been your role in all of this in terms of either uh, informing your fellow tourist stakeholder, tourism stakeholders, sorry, about what is going on? First of all, um, BTIA is a membership organization. Mm -hmm. And as a membership organization, we are responsible and we respond to our direct stakeholders who are in the tourism industry. And that is a very wide range of membership, from hoteliers to tour operators, tour guides, to, to all the small businesses and, and so on. And as a result, when the news broke, the, our members called up upon us and immediately BTIA um, organized itself and it, it went along supporting with the other groups as there were consultations that were being made in response to this. However, BTIA's concern is from an industry standpoint, mm -hmm. right? While I am not a technical person either, anything that appears to be a threat to the tourism industry, you are looking at something that... that that employs more than 25% of the Belizean working population. In fact, I was just at the industry conference, tourism industry conference this weekend, and, and they spoke very highly of the large number of visitors that are coming to this country. Now, because of the position in the economy that tourism takes, and the number of stakeholders, in this case employment, investors, and so on, anything that appears to even be a minor threat right away will create an outcry. So seismic testing, whatever it does, whatever it, they claim it does, because I've read quite a bit, but that doesn't make me any technical person, it's connected to petroleum. And anything that's connected to petroleum now raises the fear, especially since there's this, this um, there's discussion that the Prime Minister made about a moratorium. And then the question arises, if there is a moratorium, why seismic testing? And if there is successful seismic testing, means there will be wells out there. And if there are wells out there, there's going to be a spill sometime. I mean, nobody's going to forget the last spill in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that has left such a negative residue in people's mind, especially with all of the tourism areas that were affected in the, in the Gulf. And, and so with all of that, that, there is not a sense that them, um, that Belize is even prepared to deal with it, especially with the contracting and the, the people who are involved in this type of thing and the sense of responsibility. So it, it creates it creates that, that negative 
response and immediately people will defend what is theirs. Now, the other thing that caused concern and has already been alluded here is that why was there no consultation? And again, while legally they may do certain things, then there's a question then that, that, that it was something that was hidden, that something that was not supposed to come out, that it would have been done and, and gone. And so people still have the impression that, that that was that's what happened. Mm -hmm. By the time the people were discovered, they, they had already done what they had to do. So the, the, the point is, is more than just, just seismic testing in itself. It's why seismic testing, the way it was done sort of undercover, the link to petroleum, the link to damage of an industry that employs so many people that are dependent upon it. And so it is very natural for all of our stakeholders to be concerned. Yeah. All right? Yeah. No, yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, you brought up a couple of points that are very important. And one, uh, definitely, was the lack of consultations, which we saw being uh, the major point in the San Pedro uh, presentation that mm -hmm. we saw. Uh, in terms of being able to inform the public of the decision, uh, while it, it, it didn't happen, uh, it, it wasn't a clandestine operation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was an announcement made, but I think the timeline is what concerned yes. people the most. By the time the announcement went out by uh, GOB that there would be the multi-beam, potentially the seismic testing, uh, the ships were already on their way. And the decision was already made. Uh, so it, while it didn't, it wasn't a hidden operation, it was uh, almost like a done deal that could not be interrupted. I want to ask in terms of the, the collective response that you were able to gather at that time. We saw Oceana come forward, and it, it, it really started in a process uh, oh, really of advocacy in, in terms of asking questions. And there were responses, mostly in public uh, in the public domain. Yes. Um, but ultimately, what we heard from GOB at that time was that they had done their due diligence. They had ensured that there weren't going to be any uh, significant effect to the marine life if they were to proceed, as they had planned to, with these surveys. When you hear this information, given the fact that you're all involved in your own research, is it a matter of, in, in terms of when you look at potential impacts of a situation, there's the least likely and the most likely? Is it simply that the perspectives are on different end of, ends of the spectrum? You want to go ahead? <laughs> yeah. sure. Sure. <laughs> I, I think the reality of the situation was that the time frames were exceedingly short mm -hmm. and that when the press releases were sent, the, rightly so, there were responses from both Oceana and the coalition, which yes. represents a cross-section of different NGOs. Um, what we then realized is that there, there needed to be more public awareness, more information, and the reality of it is, as we've been saying, there seems to be this wide breadth of information. There seems to be there's no impact or there's significant impact. And the question then begs, well, if there is such a wide range, why not try to do something in-house, some, some sort of studies? Um, we have requested, and it had been requested previously, for the research that was used by the department to determine um, the impacts or to determine their decision because rightly so they are the technical um, people and they then had to justify why they thought no EIA was was necessary. Um, I believe they they did provide that information but it was the same day right before this um, <laughs> San Pedro consultation. Um, the, well, yeah. both the presentation from the NGOs, because we did do a presentation out there, and the consultation from the government um, people. So the truth is there was no time to get that out either. Um, but it, again, the question begs, as, as Mr. Rinaldo is implying, the time frames, the, the way that it was done, the suspicion that was then caused, and the reality of the situation is that we were getting very good feedback prior, we were saying 2015, as to a moratorium. And then in December, there was as far as a declaration 
um, that there would be a ban. Right. And to see that this is happening, we felt it was, the timing was just so suspicious. And then to find out that geology had been negotiating with this project for roughly two to three years. And I, and I wanted to get, I, I wish we had the opportunity to speak with them this morning to understand the timeline because uh, I, I, don't, I think everybody should know that it wasn't that the decision was made in September and they come in October. This is part yeah. of a much bigger initiative. Yes. And it, so. the, the ship itself in the first uh, uh, announcement by the government is that it is a part of a regional survey. Exactly. Uh, which is why there was no cost to government. Uh, essentially, they were just making their way down the Gulf and down uh, or waters here, mm -hmm. and they would be able to get the full landscape. When you hear the aspect of understanding, and you know, we, we learned this when, when the Malaysian airline crashed, that there are parts of the, the seas that people really don't know what's underneath. Uh, they don't know the topography, they don't know the marine life. It could have seemed like a pretty decent opportunity to learn more and understand what's happening in the deep offshore areas of Belize. Uh, could that have been, and I'm really asking in terms of your own objectivity, could that have been part of the impetus for them to agree, not the seismic, but the multi-beam testing? Our understanding that um, when they first dis you know, they were start f um, first starting to discuss the, um, the whole project, um, I think seismic was the first thing that was discussed, and then multi-beam was added after, no? Um, as Amanda mentioned before, um, the multi-beam does have the opportunity to provide some good scientific information that could help with marine conservation and fisheries management. Um, of course, it depends on to what extent that was negotiated with the petroleum department. Um, did they co effectively consult with the fisheries department? Did they effectively consult with, with the coastal zone management authority and institute? And port. Um, or port authority, exactly, to be able to make sure that okay, we are able to effectively map the areas and negotiate what kind of information the country can, can, the country can benefit from. Now the seismic part, um, seismic is to map the geology and hydrocarbon eras, no? so that defin it definitely has to do with you know, a it's potential to know where oil. oil deposits exactly, are. Exactly, yes. exactly. But that's the simple underlying yes. point. Mm -hmm. It's the process that you were worried about. Now, I, I asked the question earlier in terms of how it was done because the, the consultation in San Pedro, uh, part of the, one of the uh, participants there stood up and read something that a diver had recorded right. took place. Um, and if you look into how the seismic survey is done, it, it's supposed to be, you said it's air guns, so it's, they blast sound down. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we remember our basic science lesson, the sound should bounce off the bottom and come back up. Yeah. Um, now, from your research, what impact can that have on the marine life? Let me, let, let me jump in here okay. just a little bit. In the... In the in, in our analysis, strictly from a term, tourism stakeholders' point of view, that there are concerns with regard to the flora and the fauna, as is natural, yeah. right? But whether it's a whale, a dolphin, the, whatever the visitor comes to look and enjoy, and whatever we share, and so on. However, um, when this came out, immediately there was a post on Facebook in which somebody mentioned that they were diving the night before and they had to come up and then you know there were these huge claps and it affected their, their hearing and so on well that, that that is a big question uh, and this is where it gets scientific but whether or not and, and as a colleague of mine was saying whether or not it is like standing next to a loud speaker in a discotheque and it's bearable for those who are willing to bear or whether we are a hundred feet in the neighborhood and somebody's speaker is blaring and then we are there listening to it and it's, it's a nuisance or whether we are far, far away and it's, it's, it's in the background. Now, whether, whether, whether the results came from that scientific aspect and whether the, the level of, of death or physical harm is permanent, you know, the scientists will dispute and there are different people who come up with different results, again, depending upon their perspective. In our case, because of the fact that we invite visitors into this country to enjoy the natural resources, the natural marine resources, any one of our divers, anybody who's snorkeling out there and who hear whatever the lo level of this thunderclap, yes. it is not a natural sound in that environment mm -hmm. and would automatically create some concern. 
right? So whether or not that was a true statement or that was just prepared as a, as a combat to the, to the present um, situation, it is a concern. It is not a normal sound to be heard by our people. No. If our visitors are alerted and say for the next two or three days, and let, let's say over a weekend, let, let's say when, when the number of visitors are the least, you know, let's say from Friday right through till Sunday, we will be doing these tests and, and, and they're advising, you know, like when you have the gun range yeah. and that, you know, yeah. stuff, stuff like that. But there was nothing like that. And, and so it leads to believe two things, that there was either a deliberate attempt to hide or that um, geology and petroleum, they may not be so much involved with the public side of things. And that if the Department of Environment, let's say, would have been involved, they would have then, you know, guided or whatever the case. However, the bottom line is that it happened. It created an outcry because people saw their livelihoods threatened. And the fact that the other processes were not in place then just created immediately some linkages and some causes of concern that led them to believe that all of this was deliberate and it was intended to hide. And, and that, that, that's the perception, regardless of how, how, it, how it came. And then even when they, because the BTIA wrote the minister on it, they, um, we sent out a press release, but also even the press release that came back from the government was in a sense apologetic. Yeah. And, and they were saying that, look, we, we are sorry, we, you know, we, will, we will proceed with the, with the proper way to do it. Right? So even they themselves recognize that, that, that they did not do it the proper way. Now, as to what is the proper way, considering the level of stakeholders out there, mm -hmm. now, you will still get a large level of outcry, even if they do it the proper way, because that perceived threat will still be there. And then going back to the diver, I mean, if, if the diver is in fact very close, what is the effect to that diver? And then very close within the marine ecosystem, is, is, is a relative term, whether, whether, it's, um, whether it's a couple hundred feet away or 500 or one kilometer or whatever the case may be, it is a relative term. But the fact that our people are out there diving in the blue hole, diving along the reef, diving out there where this is happening, for us, that is a major cause of concern. And again, the last thing we would want is that some diver or somebody gets hurt and gets affected and, and I know, and, and I have quite a number of colleagues from BTB, from PACT, and all of us are on the same page. All of us love Belize, and all of us don't want anything negative to happen to Belize. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have to do what is necessary to protect and at least to be, provide the oversight and be the watchdog so that when these things happen, then we, our membership through us then provides a response that is necessary mm -hmm. in that do situation. Do you guys believe and this is for either of the three of you guys. Do you believe that government may have simply yielded or acquiesced to the outcry simply because, let's face it, last week was a tough week for the government of Belize, <laughs> and maybe they didn't want to take on another right. issue of question. this magnitude. <laughs> Timing. Yeah, that's what possible. possible. I, I would want to think it's a little more than that. I think, um, honestly, the tourism <coughs> sector and the environmental were upset and there were calls being made, <coughs> significant number of calls being made to their area rep um, and to the Minister of Tourism yeah. specifically. Yeah. And so I would think that you would have to address that. As a politician, you have to address your stakeholders and their interests and their concerns. Mm -hmm. And I think that proper consultation is a huge factor of what happened. I do believe that um, the same last week, the Monday was when a presentation was made on seismic and shortly thereafter questions were asked and, and it could be you were thinking in your field and you didn't think yeah. tourism had to know, you didn't think mm -hmm. the schedules had to be made public, you didn't, those considerations were not made. Sure. And that's why public consultation is important because then you can get the full scope of who is concerned. Because at that point, our comment was, how can we tell fishermen, especially from the north, who go out for multiple days at a time on a vessel, they won't know what's happening and to reach them is very difficult. Yeah. So the concern of timing was a huge factor and exactly so. Concerns of perception as well. If I have to tell a dive tourist, uh, tourist who wants to go dive that 
oh, by the way, we have a seismic vessel. Instantly, you know, have the radars go up and, well, why is Belize doing that? And mm -hmm. that is, I think, something very significant, mm -hmm. that people who come here for tourism and to enjoy the resources that we have cannot believe that we are entertaining something of this nature yeah. because our resources are so unique. Yeah. And the fundamental question, I think, is uh, for me, mm -hmm. even if the seismic survey proceeded uh, as scheduled, why do we need this information? And, and I think I asked the question, I've heard people of the environmental uh, and other entities ask the very same question. If we have moved and if we had the declaration and the celebration that followed after where there would be a ban on offshore oil exploration, why is this information necessary? I know you have posed this question. What has been the response that you have gotten so far? That has not been responded. We have not gotten that directly responded. I, I, I wouldn't want to infer or guess as to why and the timing. All we know is that geology did say when price is low is the time to do the studies. So we can, we, that was the answer that was given. I wouldn't want to, to guess as to why. I do think that what this past week did show is it's a reconfirmation that Belizeans are not interested in oil. And the truth of it is, given everything happening globally and climate change, yeah. we should not be um, perpetuating our oil dependencies. Mm -hmm. We should be looking into other, mm -hmm. other avenues, perhaps, that we can start showing what green and green technology looks like within perhaps the tourism sector. But that involves a lot of conversation that has not begun, I think. Yeah. Let, me, let, me, let me add in here too. It, for me, a lot of it is a question of perception. Mm -hmm. Again, we're talking oil, right? There is still the big question in our people's mind. How many of us do benefit from the oil? We have oil in the West. They do employ a certain amount of people. They do contribute to the economy in terms of foreign exchange. But out of what exists and out of any, any finding of oil, how much of it will the Belizean people benefit as compared to the level of stakeholders that are in the tourism industry? That is not saying that a few of people will not benefit, but the greater concern is that more of the benefit will go to people who are abroad mm -hmm. and very little will come to us. The other thing has to do with the whole aspect of the of the, the, the compliance and audit and all of the things that, that will come with it to ensure that none of the negative situation, none of the spills or nothing will happen. And I am sure that in the majority of people's mind, it will happen, it's only a matter of when, right? And whether we prepared for something like that. If the big countries have had their cases of major losses, what do you think about a small country like us? So the, the perception, the Belizean perception is that even if there was, we are not ready and it will take us to a long, long step to get to that point of being ready. And as I said, within, within the general <coughs> processes from beginning to, to end, the way how we operate, there's a lot of doubt as to whether or not a lot of the questions would be answered. And that would be, there would be many, many more questions than there would be answers. And because of that, it creates that perception where nobody in the tourism industry wants to put at risk any one of their industries. And that is not talking to the fishermen who rely on that. Mm -hmm. However, even the tourism industry and the fishermen are directly linked because a lot of the tourism industry use a lot of the fishermen, yeah. the local the fishermen, local as a part of the local based organization who benefit out of this. And, 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 and from the perspective, and in speaking to a number of people in our industry, they do not see and even though maybe somewhere in their mind they may want to align it with government's position, maybe they may want to believe that, that you know, there is value. At this point, they do not see it. And as a result, until they feel that the authorities will be in a position to convince them and show them and almost guarantee, I, I think that is a long, long road. And even me, I am not seeing it, at least in my lifetime. Let me, let me play devil's advocate here, if I may, just to get another take on, on this particular issue. The public outcry, as far as uh, to my knowledge, is, okay, we are fearful of an oil spill or any other 
harmful or detrimental uh, effects of this activity. But isn't it just the initial phase, so to speak, what they would have been doing out there would be, can be seen as the very, very uh, elementary stage of whatever is to come in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it would seem as if though we're making all of this noise now, but we're far away from even having uh, discovered oil, putting a platform out there and, and extracting oil from the deep seas. Aren't we making a big deal over something that we could say, well, look, it's the very, very initial stage at this point. But it's how do you want to use your natural resources? Mm -hmm. Do you want to use it for long-term sustainable gain through tourism and, and sustainably managed fisheries? <laughs> or do you want to look at the, the short-term gain? Um, we, we know that this country during the 70s, 60s and 70s, all of the sea, all of the coastal area had been seismically tested. It had been looked at. Granted, it was older technology, but if it was a significant amount of oil and large reserves, they would have been found already. Mm -hmm. So what you are looking for is pockets, small pockets that perhaps are not long, the short term you'll get perhaps from the short term exploration, you'll get some significant income, but it won't last very long. Yeah. And I'll use the example of BNE. BNE's well is already on its tail end of production. So at most we got a decade. Is that really what we want to look at from a natural resource point of view? We're talking sustainable development long term. It it's really begs the question as to how do you want to use your resources? And it's not only ours. I do want to put here that the Belize Barrier Reef System, the World Heritage Site, is global patrimony. We have been tasked to manage a resource that is, has been recognized of international value. Yeah. We need to start getting off the endangered list and marketing that from a tourism point of view. I mean, you look at Galapagos, you look at mud flats in Africa, they have more tourism than we do. Let, and, and I'm glad you brought up that point because I wanted to, to uh, bring Nadia in for that particular perspective. The last time we were talking, it was about the final indicators uh, that government had to meet within a very relative uh, short timeline. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seemed that there was a lot more progress made. How does this issue impact uh, the status uh, as a World Heritage Site? It, it certainly is a cause for concern. Um, given the fact that um, the proposed legislation that the um, Prime Minister had mentioned in December of 2015 um, have not been legislated. Yes. Um, also given the fact that this one kilometer buffer that they are proposing, um, that hasn't been um, um, really analyzed and provided, um, and the World Heritage Site Committee has not been given a, an, an effective answer in, in terms of explanation of why this one kilometer buffer, no? because they had came back to the, to, um, the, the government and asked, could you clarify why you said that um, one kilometer buffer will be placed around each of the World Heritage Sites and, um, and along the Barra Reef now? Mm -hmm. So those answers haven't been given. And, and the time is really you know, fast approaching. I mean, we're talking about December 2016. December is the deadline, is, right? Yeah, the end yeah. of December. And now we have this issue of seismic testing, which will mm -hmm. most likely... And we live in a global yeah. world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, social media, the speed in which you get information. Yeah. Granted, it's not all accurate information. But the, <laughs> speed, the, source, the yeah. speed at which you get it is yeah. phenomenal. And, and like they say, bad news travels quicker than good news. Well, it did pick me, up. We did see some articles from the Caribbean and other uh, international groups speaking out about the threat to the World Heritage Site. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that people are paying attention. Yes. Go ahead. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me jump in on the question that you asked, right? I'm a numbers person. I mean, my, my profession and my work is management, and we operate by numbers. The numbers don't lie. So ultimately, Statistics for me is extremely important and we will gather statistics and we will collect. And it's important that, that you have information and how you use it depends upon how in, ultimately how you intend to sell and how you intend to make corrections and adjustments within your business. Now whether or not the government approve this is just a data gathering, mm -hmm. right? Maybe a totally legitimate point and maybe totally I don't want uh, maybe acceptable within certain norms, mm -hmm. but because of the history, because of the 
experiences that we've had, then, then we and the people that we represent automatically connect the dots. And in connecting the dots, it, it, even if it was only data gathering, it does not come over, it would not come over as that. That, that the urgency and the way it's done and the timing, you know, everything links up to there's more to it than what is the eye, right? I'm a kind of person that I believe that I believe in the nine tens. I don't believe in the, in the one yeah. ten. That, that is me. That is me. And so what is there in that nine tens that we don't know? And it's in there that more questions exist than answers. And, and we need those answers. And when the Minister of Tourism <clears throat> himself personally comes out and stands and defends, and he says he will defend, and he said he did, and, and I believe him. Questions I, I believe him totally yeah. that he will defend, mm -hmm. right? And whether or not he is able to 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 garner the necessary forces to support any type of ban, no, that is something that we be looking forward to, mm -hmm. right? But again, I recognize he's one person within the the broader mm -hmm. group. But yes, I, I do believe that data is important. I do believe that, that it has to be done. And whether it's been done of timing or whether it's, that's what we've been told, I do believe that because of the linkages that exist and the way how traditionally things are given to us, there is that doubt. And you in that doubt... You speak of uh, perception, and I, I get that. I understand um, that what people believed to be so may not necessarily be so that's what mm -hmm. that's what creates perception um as far as i've heard the government say and this would be attributed to uh ceo dr young he's mm -hmm. saying well we're embarking upon a transparent process here and i think the people who were there in san pedro immediately scoffed at the idea that that was indeed yes, transparent yes, yes. based on what had happened initially that, that is correct mm -hmm. that is right? correct um my question, however, though, is that with all this having been said and done, would the environmental community still be open to any form of um, dialogue going forward with transparency in place and the free access to information from government being set as one of the, the, the pillars for, for this to go forward? Dialogue as to regarding moving what topic forward? Okay, in the sense that this may not necessarily be something that's over and done with at mm -hmm. this point, simply because people have said no. If there's another government administration to come in and they say we'll revisit this issue, but they put in place the idea that this will be a transparent process from the beginning to the end, if they say, well, look, we will make ourselves and the information that we have available to the public to be able to be well informed on this issue. Would the environmental community still be open to sitting down and looking at this issue again? I think dialogue is a necessary process. I think when you talk good governance, you talk about accountability, transparency, mm -hmm. active public participation, consultation. Um, I do think though we have to be very clear when it comes to the environmental community, our stance is a ban on oil. Mm -hmm. We have never wavered on that mm -hmm. from five years from when we did offshore, from when offshore, offshore yeah. and in, in protected, protected areas. areas on land there are pockets and areas that can be discussed but i mm -hmm. think that position from the environmental and from pe from the coalition of of groups that have amalgamated that has been um i cannot speak to the tourism sector mm -hmm. but i'm saying mm -hmm. in regards to that um and i do think that that you have to know yourself and know your people. You cannot mm -hmm. expect to push something by in the times that we are in and not have the transparency and the accountability and the public on your side when you are trying to do major initiatives. This is a developmental issue. It's, it's, it's talking about the resources and how you're moving forward in terms of future planning. I think that is something we have to put in, in terms of that context and obviously the people of San Pedro and in the sector. And I will say, it's not just San Pedro. San Pedro was that day, mm -hmm. but Hopkins, Placencia, yeah. um, basically l most of your tourism sector within these very, even inland yeah. Cayo, the tourism sector on a whole Some sees it as style. something yeah. that is not compatible with the product that we are offering. Mm -hmm. And that you're being asked to sell yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. can, can I 
you know, to bring the conversation up to speed and moving from this point forward. Mm -hmm. uh, the announcement was made, and we saw it uh, happen right at the end of the so consultation, the that the government has decided he to he suspend did. the survey. Um, now, it doesn't mean stop. It doesn't that's, mean abandon the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, what has been communicated to you so far in terms of what this suspension means? He said very clearly in, in the portion of the story that we saw, uh, suspension for public consultations. Um, from what you know of the regional survey that is taking place, and I know you had some uh, very uh, steadfast, advocates monitoring the ship and where it was yes. and where it was moving <laughs> and, and, and it's fantastic you know I think when people take on that role of guardians it's, it really shows that the power that we have but what happens now I think that that's for the Belizean context and for us to decide the idea of public consultation is exactly that but I will have to say they were then the comment that it's going to cabinet tomorrow Mm -hmm. So the, the, the conversation and what I understood is that tomorrow at Cabinet, they're going to decide how they're going to move forward with this oil conversation. And there has been draft legislation proposed for a moratorium and how to proceed on that. I would want to think that the Cabinet has now realized that they're, the people they represent, in particular within the tourism sector, which is as we were breaking down quite a few districts, <laughs> quite a few area reps, that they realize that their constituents are going to hold them accountable for this because they, there is an outcry and there is a discussion that it is not a compatible exercise. And so we need to keep that in mind. But we, we do know that the, comment, the, the exact quote is that it is a suspension, and we are aware. But like I said, there, the understanding was that, that tomorrow at Cabinet, it should be a substantive item. Where is the ship currently? Let me, let me, let me, um, <laughs> let, let me add to that, is that um, as, as, as you rightly mentioned, the largest number of our stakeholders are on the coastal areas and rely upon the marine resources. Okay. Yes, a certain section of our stakeholders also use the rainforest, um, part of the Belize Audubon Society's areas that they manage, as well as the archaeological sites, the caves, and so on. But the largest part of it is marine. Is marine. We've done no, no. Even, even with it being done right now, mean the right way, transparent, and so on. I think there's a huge credibility gap. And in that, there has to be the most massive, well thought out communication strategy to influence people who are already locked into a certain way. And that absence of trust is going to be one that is going to be the most difficult barrier that they will have to, to pass. So, whatever and however, whichever way they're going to put together these consultations, it cannot be the normal consultation where you just go and present and two people are there to answer the questions and then afterwards the consultation is over. If they really mean to do it the proper way, it has got to be well thought out because you already, you already have a wall, a huge wall that is blocking people's minds and within that process, it, it, has, got to be, it has got to be well, well thought out. It, it's going to be a major marketing effort and even with that, how the selling is going to be, mm -hmm. I, we, we, we better see. Oh, yeah, we've done, just to add to what um, Mr. Um, Guerrero said, um, we've done research and um, it has proven that at least 190,000 Belizeans are dependent on our marine in environment, including our system, of course. Now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we know the significant, the significant contribution mm -hmm. that it already makes yes. without any further testing. That's correct. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. so I, I could tell you that myself as a son of a fisherman who still fishes as a scuba diver certified yeah. scuba diver who i enjoy to see anything that threatens it to it raises some serious questions in my mind i had asked about where the ship is since you all have been monitoring it's in mexico <laughs> <laughs> it's moved north yeah <laughs> now and to be very I, I mean i'll ask you because you you are better acquainted with the systems uh this survey uh, was, Belize was invited to participate. There is zero cost to the country of Belize. 
uh, financial costs. Financial. Um, they were traveling down the Gulf in front of Mexico, in front of Belize, and they were going to get the full scope of the information all this way. Given the fact that they've moved back up to Mexico, uh, do you think that perhaps the opportunity has been lost? Uh, what, what is the impression that you get from uh, the investigations that you have done? <laughs> I, I think you're asking the wrong crowd yeah. question. Yeah. I, you're, you're asking the wrong if crowd because, because, people because I, my stakeholders would write away and say that, that no, we're happy if, yeah. if it's lost. So, so I, I think, I think no, no, no. you... I'm not asking you if you're happy if it's lost. <laughs> I'm saying we know when you're invited mm -hmm. to participate in mm -hmm. a regional mm -hmm. survey, mm -hmm. it is based mm -hmm. on the convenience of those who are funding it and they have already brought the ship here, mm -hmm. initiated for mm -hmm. one day. Uh, it was suspended and they're moving back up. Will this company, does it have an interest, such a vested interest, that it will pay to send the ship and the equipment back down to Belize to collect this information? What is the likelihood of that? Well, it's part of a bigger initiative, so we don't know if they've done Honduras already. Mm -hmm. So I would think that if, if that's the case, then yes, it's open. If not, then it probably is a loss because they wouldn't, I don't see you sending all of that equipment <laughs> and all of yeah. those resources mm -hmm. back. When it's time and money. You know? Yeah, mm -hmm. but do recall they were operating for three days, so who knows what, what data they, they got and already. how much data they, they got they covered the already. They covered. And mm -hmm. the multi beam was completed because that had been scheduled earlier with a separate vessel. This was not the vessel that did multi beam. Mm -hmm. So you have the, the MV Campeche, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and then you have the, the northern, northern, right? Mm -hmm. The northern was the one that was doing the seismic. seismic. The Campeche mm -hmm. was the like resource, okay, resource vessel, but there was an additional vessel, a smaller blue yeah. one, if I believe. Forgo. I can't remember. Forgo. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So that one was doing the multi beam, but the multi beam, like we said, was not um, as obvious. <laughs> of a, I think that was the image that kept showing on the screen was the multi beam. Mm -hmm. The multi beam uses different technology. Yeah. So uh, we know we saw uh, at the end of last week where you mm -hmm. celebrated the fact that you were able to uh, get government to suspend the activities of the seismic survey. Um, but what is the active role that you take on now? Are you waiting to be yes, invited sir. to a public consultation? Mm -hmm. um, what is your role at this point in time? Well, I think, yes, we are. And we are hoping that on the entire concerned citizenry is invited and they are very open public it is a national issue it is of national concern and that we will keep our eyes and ears open and there is actions that we are looking at and we are trying to proceed forward like i said um the moratorium is 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 i understand part of the discussion tomorrow and and we will continue steadfast we've done so for five years i do want to remind yeah. people that Oil has been a conversation in this country for a while. Um, and I think what this proved last week was that people haven't forgotten and people really do think, as Mr. Guerrero is saying, it is a very heart-touching, brain-stimulating kind of conversation <laughs> because it touches everything. If we are just people who enjoy the sea, we feel compelled. And if my business is dependent on it, being a fisherman, or tourism, then we are even more compelled. Fly fishing, and you have a lot of tourism stakeholders yeah. of different nature. So I think it touches a lot of us, and it's something mm -hmm. that we are all concerned about, and we want to keep yeah. abreast as to what is happening and keep the inform keep that dialogue open. As rightly said, we we are here to kind of get the information out to share what we know. Um, and we want to be part of the dialogue, we want to be, and not to profess that we know everything, <laughs> um, but we do think that if you're going to make decisions, you should at least get people who know what's important, and that's what we're flagging more than anything. Is this a time that World Wildlife Fund will push for the legislation now? Oh, yes, I remember you spoke of your online campaign that at yes. one point almost crashed surveys, uh, <laughs> servers, servers of for course, the government. Yeah, we continue yeah. to do that, um, <laughs> exactly, and, and getting that petition out there to the broader public. Mm -hmm. So, of course, that, that campaign is still, you know, very active and we're going to try and ramp it up as, you know, even more. Mm -hmm. in, in our case, we, um, in essence, we are aligning ourselves with the, our environmental colleagues. And, but a lot of it depends upon what comes out tomorrow. And that will set the pace for what is going to be the next step. 
I know for us, we will be pushing our advocacy program and we will be pushing our membership. And even those who are not members, we are looking to, to expand our base. But it's, it's, it, a lot of it depends upon how government approaches it. And as I said, um, we, we cannot dispute the fact that every single one of us, including members of government, all of us love Belize and all of us will give whatever it takes out to Belize. But whatever is a perceived threat to Belize, all of us will rise and defend. I mean, it, that, that, that's what it comes down to. And um, we, we might take the fight at this level, we might take it further, but I mean, it's, 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 it's bring it out in the open, bring it out in the open and then let's see what happens. And I think that's what we're looking for. That's a fairly uh, fair way of looking at things, objective. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you and very as much. you pointed thank you. out, it's not over yet. No. Uh, <laughs> so we will keep following it. We appreciate yeah. you being here to share your perspective. Right. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and take a break and we'll be back in a few, so stay tuned.